Okay, so welcome to the show, Environmental Harmony Podcast, Sydney. I'm so glad you were able to make time to talk with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really Absolutely. excited to have a discussion with you. Absolutely. So you are a natural dying master from what I've seen. You have a, an amazing Instagram presence. And could you just um, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your business and what you do? Yeah, so... My name is Sydney Goss, and my business is called Sydney Goss Silks. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, have something really, really simple for people to remember. Um, but my business is essentially, um, I make products. I have a complete dye garden that I pull from in terms of, you know, natural color and botanicals. Um, and I teach classes as well. So my garden fuels how I make my products and how I teach classes. Um, so it's a completely sustainable model, um, which is something that I really value. And um, I think if, if you're a natural dyer, that's something that's really important is, you know, how, how can you be as natural as possible? Yeah, it's like that connection with the land. You're bringing it full circle by growing all of your own products as well. Yes. Now you just have to start raising silkworms. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Weaving my own silk. <laughs> yeah. So how did you begin down this journey? So um, I was in New York State working on my master's in sculpture. And um, I definitely was interested in a more fiber-based concentration for some of my thesis work. So I was working with paper making, um, basic garment construction to, to make, you know, contemporary sculpture. Um, but as I was working with these materials, I thought, how can I alter the color in a, in a natural way? Um, and so I just started doing my own research. And um, at first it was very trial and error you know there's there's so many different components to natural dyeing that you kind of have to understand before your natural color is more permanent and how you extract color from natural um plants barks even bugs um and so it, it's pretty it's pretty multi-layered and complex in that way um but so i just started with like the basics. I used like avocado skins and avocado pits um, to bring out a nice like mauve pink. And I experimented with um, dyeing paper pulp with that color and dyeing fabric with that color to bring into my to bring into my uh, sculptural work. And to me, it it just gave the work a more thoughtful um, uh, depth. You know, it became more yeah, absolutely. once, once you know, food waste was used to color this fiber that I then manipulated even more. So um, I would say it all kind of started there. Um, from that, once <laughs> I graduated, um, I just, I got obsessed. And I always tell people in my classes that like, you know, you, you will become obsessed with this. So like tread lightly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> If, if you're not in the market for a new hobby, maybe don't try this because <laughs> you won't be able to stop. Um, what a great hobby, though. I mean, I can imagine so many things that I have that I would love to to try this on. Yeah. And then you start wondering, like, well, could this give me a dye? Could this give me, you know, a different color? Um, so it's just like this process that begs to be figured out. Um, and I think that that's what I was like super attracted to uh, when it came to it is that it was endless. Um, so after I was self-taught for like a year, maybe, um, that's when I was like, okay, I'm kind of reaching this point where everything's kind of a pastel color and I really want richer tones. Like how can I learn more about mordanting techniques? Um, so I just started taking classes with people who were, in my opinion, true masters of, of certain dye techniques. So um, I took a cochineal class with an indigenous um, cochineal grower up in New York. What's cochineal? 
So cochineal is a parasite um, or mm. pest that attaches itself to prickly pear cactus. Does um, it create that white fuzziness? Yes. So it okay, I've seen the, that. Yeah, the the white uh, kind of fuzzy mold on a cactus paddle. Um, but and it's bright point, red. I've noticed that doing yeah. landscaping, like we'll remove that just by hand and it's like a bright red. Is that the color of the dye that you get from it? Yeah. So it's, so you, can get, you can get multiple colors from it. Um, it ranges, but you kind of scrape it off the, the paddle um, and you can kind of grind it down mm -hmm. um, or you can draw a bath with it and it can give you basic magentas different fuchsia tones, um, but you can push it uh, using, you know, different alkaline methods or acidic method or methods to either a bright like flag red or a really rich purple. Wow. So um, luckily I had uh, access to um, a cochineal grower up in Ithaca, New York, and um, his family was back in Mexico had a huge prickly pear farm. And so they actually um, harvest a cochineal. And so I was able to learn from someone who could teach me um, more of like an authentic way of extracting that color um, and, and respecting that color. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, that class was, you know, it, it changed everything for me. Wow. Um, so you talk about adding more like acidic or alkaline ingredients. What what are you using as inputs? I assume that's like in a bath kind of scenario when you're soaking the, is it cochineal or cochineal? It's cochineal. Cochineal. That's how, that's how Jose pronounced it was like a, instead of a CH, more of an SH, cochineal. Cochineal. Okay. Yeah. Um. So basically once you grind those little bugs and you create that like magenta powder, you then add it to a pot of, you know, five gallons of distilled water. It's really important to work with distilled hmm. um, because some of our water can be harder on, or, you know, just have other agents in it that can alter that color. And that may not be your plan. Um, but so with cochineal, we worked specifically with distilled water so that we could get its true color, which is that really beautiful pink. Um, once we, one of my tasks during the class was to actually juice a whole bunch of limes. Um, mm -hmm. And so we used limes to push it to a more acidic bath, um, which, you know, the smells that started to enter the space while we were working was like intoxicating. Mm -hmm. um, so we used lime as our acid, and then for our base, we actually used soda ash. Okay. Um, so more of like a chemical agent to push it to that cooler um, purple color. But I, we could have used baking soda, I think. Um, there's a whole bunch of different like basic, you know, um, agents that we could have used, but we used soda ash and that that brought it to this like rich grapey kind of purple, which was beautiful. That sounds super beautiful. So with this process, I've tried dyeing things just with coffee grounds or um, like onion skins, and I haven't looked into it at all. It's just, you know, it's so fascinating. It's such a huge creative world. That's why I wanted to have you come on and talk about it. But I know there's an aspect there that I'm missing. That's like, you have to have something to fix the color, right? Is it, were you saying that's the mordant? Yes. So mordanting is, it's basically just as important as finding color essentially, because um, if you don't properly mordant your fiber, that color is just going to stain it rather than dye the cloth. Um, and that was the issue that I was running into in the beginning as well is like, what is a mordant? How do I measure a mordant? Um, do mordants shift based on the type of fiber that I'm using? And mm -hmm. that's where it gets more complicated. And then there's also, um, I, I like to think of it as a gift from like the natural dye gods. 
um, certain dyes that don't require a mordant, um, onion skins being one of them, uh, pomegranate skins. <coughs> so let's see what else. The avocado pits and skins don't require a mordant either. Um, but essentially, a mordant is a way to fix the fiber so that the natural color bonds to the fiber. So um, for, you know, I won't go super into it, but for something like cotton fabric, you would want to use aluminum acetate. And for protein... What, what is, just to um, clarify, what is that derived from? Because, like, obviously this is such an ancient practice. So I love looking back at, like, what would our grandmothers have used to get aluminum acetate? Well, so I can't really answer that for you, but what I can say is um, historically urine was actually... Really? as a mordant um and i think this was probably more during the renaissance era um because we had ammonia in in our urine and that was that again that was just kind of like a natural agent to help that color bond to the fiber mm -hmm. um but now we've got aluminum acetate so we use that for cellulose stuff so like cotton linen bamboo you would want to use aluminum acetate and that's just sold as like a really fine powder. Um, and then for protein fibers, like silk wool, um, let's see, alpaca, those fibers would call for aluminum sulfate. So yeah, the two, the two work on the fiber in different ways. There's different heating components for each, um, so like every type of fiber, you'd have to use a different kind of measurement of mordant and a different heat. And so then you're heating the fiber with the aluminum sulfate or acetate mm -hmm. and like it's saturating it and then it will absorb the dyes. Yeah. So basically the natural color attaches itself to that aluminum. Mm, gotcha. so it's not really, it's not really attaching itself to the fiber necessarily as it is more to the mordant itself. Um, but like I said, you know, there's some gifts where we can actually use different dye baths without a mordant because there's a, a high tannin yield in the dye stuff itself. Mm -hmm. So that, that is almost um, acting as your mordant. Wow. And does that go across all the different fiber categories? So like protein fibers, as you were just mentioning, or um, mm -hmm. the, the plant cellulose fibers? Yeah. So yeah, basically, um, if there's high tannin content in the dye stuff, um, then that it's it's kind of like a mordant and a dye all in one, and mm -hmm. it's works for any type of fiber. Now, wow. of course, you know you, we you can't dye any synthetic fiber with right. color, unfortunately. I know. Since I started becoming aware of like living fibers and. Uh, my my sister in law is Romanian and she's really conscious of things like that. I think just because their culture is still so it's almost like they're in like the the forties or fifties comparatively, like technologically to where we are in America. And um, she always talks about wearing living clothing. And I was she'll re dye her clothing over and over again. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of dyers talk about how um, it's it's living color essentially because. <clears throat> While a mordant makes it more permanent, um, certain dyes respond differently to um, just being out in the sun, having that UV exposure, or being washed multiple times. Um, so they do uh, they do fade over time, and I think that that's the beauty of it. Um, and like your sister in law was saying, that living color is that it's constantly in a state of flux, almost. Um, you can try to preserve it as that rich tone for as long as you as you can, but ultimately it will shift over time. And again, like being able to go back in and alter that color, re-dye it again, um, is what makes this technique and process so intriguing, I think, is that you can just constantly 
change your clothes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, cha change the, the textiles that you have in your life um, and make them exciting and new again. Right. That's what makes it so sustainable as well. And then it feels really special and meaningful. Like you're wearing something of value that's personal, I'm sure. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes I'll even think, okay, if I dye this silk blouse and in indigo right now, and I know that this indigo will fade, um, what would be another color that I would want to add on top of it so that I could potentially get a green out of this blouse? So I, I try to think, you know, ahead as well, like, um, what, what could I put on top of this? What could I, and, and redying it with the same color also is, is another option. Um, but it's just, it's just fun to think of your, of your, like, your garments or your wardrobe shifting absolutely so you did your study with jose mm -hmm. and how did your how did this all move on from there because now you have this beautiful business and you're growing your own dye plants yeah so i would say after i had the class with jose um let's see there was some time in the middle where i was doing some more experiments and then covid hit so we were in lockdown and um I'll just do a little shout out to Botanical Colors, their natural dye company out in Seattle. Um, they started hosting online workshops during lockdown <clears throat> and inviting some of the most well-known dyers to kind of facilitate those workshops. So I signed up to take an indigo class with Abu Bakar Fafana, who um, doesn't like to say that he's a master of indigo, but in my opinion, I definitely think that he is. Um, and we I think for five, three or five days, um, we learned how to draw up a natural fructose uh, indigo vat um, as a class online. Um, wow. he, was, he was in France. We were all over the world um, and, you know, we were shipped the materials from botanical colors. So we had everything we needed. Um, you just had to like, you know, acquire pots and pans and buckets. Um, that sounds like so much fun. <laughs> but that was <laughs> honestly, I would say that, you know, between uh, Jose's class and Abu Bakr's class, that was where I learned the most it was the most robust knowledge that I could have um, you know been exposed to Abu Bakar is from West Africa has an indigo farm um, and dyes cloth with indigo as as his full-time you know career feels like a funny word but um, it's like what he does with his life um, is is indigo everything is about blue um and it was a very spiritual class it wasn't just about learning the chemistry it was about again respecting the color the history the origin of indigo um acknowledging that it has been abused um by white settlers um in the states and in other countries as, as well um and then learning how to kind of decolonize that dye as, as we're learning these very um, specific things about it. So um, once I completed that class, I was just like on fire for everything. You know, um, those two classes taught me a lot about solid based dyeing techniques. Um, and then from there, I said, okay, eco printing. I know that this is the thing that I haven't tackled yet. Um, and then bundle dyeing, of course, which is kind of like a sister to eco printing. Um, and that's Can you describe, kind of, like you said, solid base printing. So what is that? Well, so I was working with solid dyes. So changing a square or a yard of cloth from white to pink um, or from white to blue. And... Uh, bundle dyeing and eco printing allows you to have a multicolored cloth okay um, with different dye stuff um, 
but eco printing is essentially what I do specifically now, mm -hmm. um, which is taking a botanical, like a flower, petal, uh, leaf, laying that out on more into cloth, um, bundling it up between um, a rigid core and a resist and steaming it. And while you steam it, that natural color uh, transfers onto that fiber and makes a pretty clear print of that flower or of that leaf. Um, and so it is, it's essentially capturing uh, the memory of that flower, if you will, and imprinting it onto the, onto the fabric. Yeah, it's almost like photography. Yeah, and sometimes your prints can be that clear where you can see the lines and the petals. Um, and to me, that was such a, while I love everything about natural dyes, that was such a rewarding technique to learn. Um, and I think that that's why I've been more fixated on it. Mm -hmm. um, is that then it was like, okay, well, what can I, will this leaf print? Will this flower print? Working out different steam times for all of those. I was really interested in that. Um, and so my dye garden now um, has all botanicals uh, that are able to be eco-printed with. Wow. So when you describe this process, you said a, you sandwich your cloth with, that's soaked in mordant between a rigid core and a and what was the other word you said a resist yeah a resist what, what is that so a resist <laughs> um <laughs> it, it has a lot of different definitions depending on how you're using it but um within this context i'm i'm merely just using a plastic sheet um okay. between the the cloth um so that it doesn't continue to print over on itself repeatedly but mm -hmm. instead has a single print in one spot and that gotcha. allows that because I'm bundling that fiber up on a copper pipe which is that rigid core mm. um, it will touch itself as I roll it again and again and again so the re resist acts as that barrier so that I can just print that flower in that one spot Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. And then you're, are you using an iron or how, what's your steaming methodology? Um, I, <laughs> I just have these giant aluminum pots, um, with a steaming basket in the, in the base. And I add the completely bundled fabric on the copper pipe, uh, to that pot, add my lid on and steam it for, it depends on what I'm using, but it's it generally is like seven to ten minutes of a steam time. Wow! Um, and once you unbundle it, it's done. So it looks a lot. It looks easy in person because you're like, wow, that took like seven or ten minutes. But um, what you're not calculating is how long it took to mordant how long it took to grow that plant. Yeah, absolutely. How long it took to, <laughs> until the plant flowered. Right. Um, so, and um, to develop the knowledge and answer all of these questions that you're shedding some light on right now. <laughs> yeah. So um, it is, it is a long process, but like I said, that the last part of it, when you finally get to be creative, lay out your pattern of botanicals, and bundle that up that's that's like the the christmas morning of the whole practice it's yeah it's exciting it's um quick <laughs> and and then after that you've got a beautiful um textile but what point did you decide you wanted to do this um in a business capacity well one thing that um is interesting and annoying and fun about natural dyeing is because you're experimenting so much you just have all these samples all the time you're just like okay I need to dye something green now and pink and purple and then you're left with all of these swatches um it, which is great if you're into like quilting or making your own mm. clothes 
uh, I am not interested in those things. So I was like only dyeing silk scarves to, to really learn, you know, color um, and mordants. And then I just had all of these silk scarves. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I have so many friends that would, that would love to, to like, you know, wear this. And I just started selling them for super cheap, like $25 a scarf. Um, so that I could continue to buy more silk scarves. Mm -hmm. Fund <laughs> um, your learning. And, yeah. And make more, um, experiments. So, um, it kind of naturally like fed into this little business. Um, and then once I learned eco printing, um, that's where I just couldn't stop. And okay. Like this flower is blooming right now. I'm going to wait for this flower to bloom. And then, like I said before, I was just left with all these little silk samples of, of work. So people just really started to love it. They're like, I want one like this. Can I commission you to do this? And so it just like organically grew into the business that it is today. So now I do um, different size uh, silk scarves. I do um, tapestries and occasionally I'll do like yardage for like a designer if they want um, like silk yardage for a particular project. Wow. Well, you can imagine yeah. that's gorgeous. The possibilities are endless. Yeah, truly. Have you done any, I would, I would think uh, like a bedspread would be pretty ultimate. Yeah, you know, I know a few natural dyers who have done a bedspread. Once you start going super large scale, you really have to be methodical of how you're bundling. Something sure. Because you've got all this material that needs to um, essentially be rolled onto itself. And it starts to wrinkle. The resist starts to get in the way. Uh, so you kind of have to be mindful about how you how you do it yeah so that you can maintain that a really clear print quality now mm -hmm. some dyers don't care about that some dyers love the kind of messy um wrinkled eco print or bundle dye and like to each their own um but i i tend to be more of a perfectionist and want that very clear print to me it is about the print um, so I'll, I'll, I'll limit how much yardage I actually do in one go. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can continue to do that same amount over and over and over again. It's just, I'm not going to bundle six yards of fabric. <laughs> right. You know, that, that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd need a full on cauldron, like an outdoor yeah. fire to steam it. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. So I imagine when you're you're learning all of this, you probably start trying to use every little leaf and berry or flower that you could find to get a print. And mm -hmm. at what point did you decide you wanted to grow your own garden? Oh, that was pretty, that was actually like a pretty easy decision um, because I was basically having to wait for other gardeners, flowers to to flower so that I could like go buy some blooms off of them mm -hmm. um, but once we moved from New York to Florida then all of a sudden I was in a climate where I could grow everything I needed to grow right all year long yeah <laughs> and so um I immediately started digging up the ground working on the soil learning how to start seeds um, learning how to nurture the dye plants because different different plants need different things and um, that was its own you know moment of of learning and to me that was also kind of like the dying it was like endless and all I wanted to do was like figure it out mm -hmm. you never figure it out you just figure out how to like solve the issues that you run into like pests or you know powdery mildew um 
things like that, which I'm sure you, you know, all about. Oh um, yeah. That's my forte. That's part of why, you know, I, I'm a gardener and I love plants so, so much. I haven't actually planted, like you're, you're talking about starting perennial flowers from seed. That's something that I haven't delved into very much because my specialization is edible landscaping. Mm -hmm. um, but that I, I've heard that that's really challenging. And some of them have really, really long germination periods. Some of them, yeah. I think I had one that was like a 10-day germination. Um, and, you know, I just waited bad. and it they all sprouted. And then I was like, all right, you know, it just teaches you patience in a different way. So, um, yeah, the, the gardening is, is like a full-time love of mine. Um, and then when things start to bloom and you can start to use those flowers, that's, that's the, like the climax of it all. Yeah. I would love to see some pictures of your garden. If you have those to share, I can uh, link them to this episode. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to share those. Do you have any favorite plants? That are your um, like, main allies for your art? Yes. I would say one of my, uh, one of the prints that I'm kind of known for is the hardy hibiscus print. Mm -hmm. So um, it's this really large hibiscus flower. Um, it, they call it a dinner plate um, because it's the size of a plate. Um, they print so, so well. And um, because I can grow them both here alongside tropical hibiscus, um, I've just got these really rich, big flower prints on the silk. Um, and I would probably say that that's, those are one of my favorites, just because the, the richness of color and the detail that the fabric picks up from each petal is outrageous. Yeah, I've seen pictures of those, I believe, on your Instagram page that are so stunning. Yeah, I love them. So i I've got um, five hardy hibiscus plants that are sprouting right now. And I'm just like, come on, guys, grow, 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 because I just can't wait for them to, to start blooming. That's when the magic really starts to happen for me. Yeah. Do you have, what do you do with the plant parts after you're done? Are you like composting them? Do you have chickens you feed them to? I don't have chickens. Um, I would compost them, but because they're technically cooked um, after you steam them, it, it doesn't go into the compost. Um, I honestly just go and shake the fabric outside and the petals just land in the grass or um, right. in the yard. And then that's, that's where they go. Nice. <laughs> that works. <laughs> and then, and, and, you know, they're really slimy. Some of them just like completely just fall apart after they've been steamed. So yeah, just shaking them in the wind is like the best method. <laughs> Yeah. So is your business your primary source of income or is it more of a side hustle slash passion project that you do because you love it? It depends. Um, right now I'm taking a break from academia, but um, I was an adjunct professor of art and art history. Um, so that that's, you know, my main love. Um, and then this is also like, you know, a part time job. Um, the goal is for it to definitely be more full-time. Um, and so we'll see kind of how it morphs into, um, into teaching. Um, but, but I love being my own boss. I love, you know, having my own schedule. Absolutely. And, yeah. So we'll see how it kind of evolves over time. Maybe classes and books in the future. Yeah, definitely, definitely more classes. Yeah. So where can people find you to buy your beautiful products or take a class from you? Um, so Instagram is a great place. It's Sydney Goss Silks, really simple. Um, and then my website is sydneygosssilks.com. And we're working on launching that, um, the shop for like June 1st. Um, okay. Yeah, I just did an article with Garden and Gun. And so that'll be in the June, July issue. Nice. Um, so launching the shop when that also hits is is my my big goal. 
okay that's also when I'm going to be having my daughter so oh my gosh a busy month (laughs) yeah congratulations I'm so excited for you yeah thank you have you been printing tons of baby clothes everyone asks me that and no (laughs) they just swaddle her in silks yeah yeah and I have I have so many um (laughs) that I can that I can choose from but yeah the baby clothes thing I just don't know I just don't have an urge to do it (laughs) which is funny to be honest but uh, fair enough you gotta feel how you're feeling yeah yeah and I was so sick during the first part of my pregnancy that the mordant smell just I couldn't get over so Uh, thankfully that's gone yes definitely are you, do you offer remote classes for people who aren't in your area? Yeah, so um, I don't do a large remote class, but I do offer one-on-one like remote dye consultations or um, a full series um, of like a dye workshop with someone one-on-one. And, I, and I've done a few of those and they've been very successful um, for both myself and the person that's taking the class because they can get one-on-one, you know, instruction from me, answer, uh, answers to all those like nitty gritty questions that, yeah, absolutely. That you have when you're starting to figure out like what a mordant is like we, like we were talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. Um, instead of having to do your own research and you're finding all these different blogs that have different answers, I can just give you those answers because I've already figured it out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's so valuable. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to link to all of your contact information in the show notes. And I have learned a ton just in our conversation now. I'm I'm so grateful that you took your time today. Yeah. I will let you get much for having me. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, your weekend as well. You too. All right. Bye. Bye.